Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. We know there are many services and meetings you could be at, so we're doubly appreciative that you've taken your time to come here. Thank you so much for that. We'll begin our meeting just with hymn number 129 in the hymn book. Verse 1 says, Behold, behold, the Lamb of God on the cross. For us he shed his precious blood on the cross. Oh, here is all important cry. Eli Lama Sabachthani, draw near and see the Saviour die on the cross. We'll sing verses 2 to 5, 129, just remain seated. Behold his arms extend. announcements as well. The following meetings will take place here in Ballykeel Gospel Hall, uh, all made uh, in the Lord's will, all these announcements. Thursday at 8 p.m. will be our prayer meeting and Bible reading, commencing at Exodus chapter 12. Next Lord's Day at 11 a.m. will be the breaking of bread, 2.30 the Sunday school, 3 o'clock the prayer meeting out in the hall at the side, and at 3.30, the gospel meeting, where our speaker will be Warren Uring, And he will tell how he got saved, so he'll be very welcome to come back for that meeting. Our speaker today is Mr. Bruce Tinsley. Thank you so much for coming, Bruce. We look forward to hearing you. And we also announce those, as is our custom, those in the area who are sick, that we'd appreciate you praying for. 
we would ask you to be praying for Sam McAtee, for May Marks, for Newell and Marley Bingham, for May Farr, Gillian Murder, Naomi Campbell, Jim Wilson, Harry McKibben, and Robert McCulkin. We could also be praying for the following sorrowing families, for the McCandless family, John McCandless's mother was buried today. Pray too for the family of Jackie Cooper, and please pray as well for the family of Harry Andrews. We'll now uh, commit our meeting to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful for another time where we can be gathered here just to tell out the gospel another time. Father, we know this message is a, a precious message. It's one that should never be forgotten. And week by week, we would seek to tell out the gospel another time. And Father, we pray that this day, those who have not yet trusted Christ, those who have maybe heard the message many a time before, those who have maybe heard hearing it today for the first time, whether in the hall or in the car park, or whether listening later online, Father, we pray if there are any lost who are not yet saved, who have not yet trusted Christ, that they will come to an understanding today and that they will indeed put their own trust in him. They would see him that he is the one who can be their savior. He is the one who has paid the debt of sin and that by simply coming to him as they are, they can be saved for all eternity. Father, we pray especially for this meeting for our brother as he would tell forth the gospel, give him help to do so. Give him help to tell it from thy word and give um, him the confidence and just be with him as he would tell it out. And Father, give us all ears to listen and minds just to take it in and to understand where our state would be if we do not trust Christ. But what glorious blessing awaits us if we trust in him today. Father, we pray for other places where the same message is being proclaimed. We pray for thy blessing Upon there too, wherever there is that earnest effort to present the Lord Jesus Christ as the only remedy for man's ruin, we pray for thy blessing, and indeed we pray for salvation. Father, we leave this meeting in thy care. We pray to you especially for those who have been mentioned already, those who are sick, experiencing difficulty, maybe not in the health they used to be. Father, we pray that thou would restore them, and we pray that thou would bring them back. Father, we pray to you for the families that are sorrowing, times where it's difficult to comfort or it's difficult to find comfort. But Father, thou art able to comfort them. We pray that thou would indeed give them that comfort that is above all that man can give. And Father, we pray too for, uh, for the, how um, these losses, Father, they can get people to consider again of <coughs> the state of eternity of the matters of life and death. And Father, we pray that thy voice will be heard and indeed thy return to Christ while in time. Father, we leave all this with thee, praying especially for this gospel meeting. May we hear of salvation. May we hear of ones being one for Christ even today. We commit it all to thy care, being careful to give thee and thy son all the glory and all the praise. We leave it all with thee in the worthy and precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll hand the meeting over now. Thank you. Now we'll read in Acts uh, chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Now we are delighted to see everyone here this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for the welcome and thank you everybody for your presence this evening. Whether you're in the hall here or listening elsewhere, we're delighted you're hearing the word of God. Now we're going to read, as I say, from a few verses in Acts chapter 17. And then we'll turn over to 1 Thessalonians. Acts 17, verse 1. If you've got a Bible, you can follow along with me, or just uh, you can listen and I can read it hopefully clearly. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them three Sabbath days, reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, 
and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of its chief women, not a few. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy. And then they, they, they're not happy with Paul's preaching at all. And First Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul's letter then to these Thessalonian believers, as they were, chapter 1. And we're going to come in there at the end of the chapter at verse 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. That is, Paul's entering in and preaching to them. What manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. And just a final verse there in chapter 2, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of man. Note that. Received the word of God not as the word of man, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in them that believe. Now God will bless the, the reading of the scriptures to our hearts. Now, we've read here a bit about the, the Thessalonians and Paul's experience in Thessalonica and then the letter that he wrote unto them afterwards. Paul had come from Asia, from Turkey as we would know it today. He'd been called into Macedonia. He'd preached in Philippi and you may well know about the, the, those that were converted in Philippi. There was a jailer who cried, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And then he moved down from Philippi and he came to this place, Thessalonica. And he, he goes and preaches there also in the synagogue. He preaches three days. And I want us this afternoon to think about what did he preach? What did he preach to these people? Secondly, I want us to think about what was their response? And thirdly, I want you to think about, all of us to think about, what is my response? What is our response to this gospel, this same gospel that Paul preached in Thessalonica? He came to that city. He went into the synagogue and he, he preached three things. There were three things in his message. We read them there in the book of Acts. He preached, and I'll just go over them here to you again. He preached that Christ must needs have suffered and that he must rise from the dead. And Jesus that I preach unto you is the Christ. That's a wonderful message. Christ must needs have suffered. It was necessary for Christ to suffer. It was necessary that he would be raised from the dead. And the one that the, the scriptures is speaking about is Jesus is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Old Testament, the Old Testament tells us about one that's coming. As soon as man sinned, God promised a deliverer. And he promised and he said there were two things about him. One, he would be bruised and he would bruise. He would crush the serpent's head, but his heel would be bruised. He promised a deliverer. God has promised a deliverer from the very beginning. And the whole record of the Old Testament is this. There's one coming and he will suffer and then he will enter into glory. He's the lamb that is foretold. He's pictured in the sacrifices that, that, that are performed over and over again throughout the Old Testament. He's the manna, the pure, the one that came down from heaven. He's the whole the whole uh, message of the Old Testament is this. There's one coming, and he will suffer, and then he will enter into glory. And then the message of the New Testament is this. Jesus is that one. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Christ. He is the one. He is the fulfiller of all that has been promised. And the message in the gospel is, believe in him, receive him, trust him, as your saviour, and you will have everlasting life. That's, that's, that is the, the core of the Bible in a, in a few words. So what did Paul preach? He preached 
Christ must suffer. Why was it necessary that Christ had to suffer? Why was it necessary that Christ must suffer? Well, just as I come to that, just to understand what we're talking about here, what Paul is saying, there's one predicted who's going to come, and I'm telling you who that person is. The Bible speaks of Christ coming. When the Old Testament spoke of them, nobody knew who he was. But then he arrived. Jesus Christ arrived upon this earth. But the scriptures tell us what sort of person he's going to be. And he's going to suffer. Why must he suffer? Why did the Lord Jesus Christ, why was it necessary for him to suffer? By that I mean he died on a cross outside Jerusalem's city wall, nailed between two malefactors, the darkness descending. He's hanging upon the cross. He cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why must he suffer? Number one, because the scriptures declared that it would be so. Paul opens the scriptures here. He declares to these people in Thessalonica what is in the scriptures. The scriptures cannot be broken. God cannot lie. He foretells the future. You know what? Here are the two, two fundamental platforms in which our faith as believers, if you're a believer in Christ, rests. What are they? The scriptures and how they foretold of Christ and how they have been fully fulfilled as far as his suffering and his first coming. The scriptures. And secondly, that God raised him from the dead. It was necessary that this person would suffer. One, because the scripture said so. Two, because we needed it. Because we needed such a savior. Because there is no other way to bring us back into relationship with God other than through the sufferings of Christ upon the cross. Why do we need him? I would like you all to understand that we are sinners by nature and sinners by practice. Everybody, we're at a distance from God by nature. Everyone that's born into this world, we're born at a distance from God. Sin is our problem. Sin separates us from God. We tell that to the children on a, a Sunday afternoon back at Balnehinch. We tell them, sin separates us from God. But, the God. but God has provided a plan, provided a way of, of saving your soul. Why did Christ suffer? Because Scripture said he must too, because we need such a Savior. What was he doing on the cross? Why was the Lord Jesus on the cross? No, this is at the center of everything, really. I would like some soul this evening. Maybe you desire salvation. Maybe you can say, oh, I, I know I'm separated from God because of sin. You don't need me to tell, tell you that I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm not right with God. I know I'm on the... The downward road. You know, I really fear the judgment that's coming against my sin and against my soul. I would love to know that I have peace with God, that the sky between my soul and God is clear. How can it be clear? Well, it was necessary. Christ must suffer because he suffered as a substitute in our stead, in our place. And if we believe in him, we have everlasting life. We don't need to suffer because Christ suffered. We can accept what he did in our place and believe on him for our salvation. Why did he rise from the dead? He rose from the dead, number one, because the scriptures said that he must. The scriptures predicted, the Old Testament predicted that Christ would do two things. He would suffer and bleed and die for guilty sinners making an atonement for sin. And two, that God would raise him from the dead and cause him to enter into glory. That's why he must rise from the dead. He must rise from the dead because God is satisfied with him. Because God owns him. Because he is God's son. 
because he is the one that has finished the work on the cross, it's not possible. It wasn't possible that he would remain in the grave. What a glorious truth is this. Jesus died and rose again to take away your sin and my sin. Do you know him? Have you come to him? Oh, I wish I could declare it more plainly. What a wonderful death, a substitutionary death, an atoning death, blood that cleanses from all sin, a sacrifice satisfying unto God, so satisfying that God raised him from the dead, a mark of absolute approval. This is my son. I have exalted him. He will come to judge the world. He will come in glory. And right now, anyone who wishes to repent, to turn to him, can be forgiven. The, the, the door of, of invitation is open. The announcement of peace has been made right now. Not forever. Only for a limited period of time. God is willing to bring you into his kingdom and give you absolute forgiveness and give you peace with himself and take away all your sin. Right now, he's, he's willing to do that because Christ has died. Yeah, rather, he's risen again and gone above and Christ will receive you and, and give you salvation. That's what Paul preached. Necessary that Christ would suffer. Necessary that God would raise him from the dead. And Jesus is this person and he alone. You know, it's possible to trust another Jesus. I'll just say that right now. There are those who will trust and follow another Jesus, which is not the Christ of the Bible, who is not the one who died an atoning death upon Calvary and to take away our guilt and be our substitutionary sacrifice, who is some different person in reality, because the only Jesus, the only Lord we preach unto you is the one who fulfills and whose character is as described in the Old Testament. The sin atoning one that suffered on the cross for us. The one that God raised from the dead. The one who is God's son. Whom, David's, whom David called him Lord because he's David's greater son. This is the one in whom we would love you to, to trust this evening. And what were the responses in Thessalonica? The responses we read, some believed and others didn't believe. Some believed, it, it describes it in the, in the letter when Paul was writing to them later, not very much later, not very longer later on. He says, you received the word of God. You received the word of God that was preached, not as the word of man, but as the word of God, as the truth of God. He says, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. And this is the response we look for in, in every heart and in every soul during this day of opportunity, to turn to God, to turn away from your sin, to turn on to the, the living God, how can God accept you? Do you promise God that you'll do a bit better and you'll try to give up the things that you've been doing thus far and promise God that you'll, you'll, you'll improve? No, that's not faith. Faith turns to God. I am a guilty sinner. I've got nothing. But thou hast given thine only son. The Lord Jesus died on the cross for me. He's my substitute. I take him as my substitute. You can do that. That is what faith is. Faith is taking Christ to be your savior. Faith is saying, not me, but him. Faith doesn't look upon their own his own deeds. Faith looks at the man on the middle cross and says, he died for my sins. He bore my sins in his own body on the tree. I don't try to add to it. Thank God I can't add to it. And if I could, I wouldn't. And if I had to, I couldn't. But he's done enough. 
He's done sufficiently. God raised him from the dead. God is prepared to meet you on the grounds of that sacrifice. God is prepared to forgive you totally on the grounds of that sacrifice. What do you need to do? You need to come and receive him. Receive what he has done for you on the cross. You need to believe. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. I am a sinner. Christ died for sinners. He died for me. I rest my soul there. You can. You can believe on him. The Thessalonians, they turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God and to wait for his son from heaven. He then says in the book of Thessalonians there, just at the end of chapter one, he lists five things. When he speaks about waiting and the Thessalonians turning, he lists five things about the one and about the work and about the person and about the situation. Five descriptions. Number one, to wait for his son. Christ Jesus is God's son, eternal forever, everlasting. God's son from heaven. That's where he is now. He once was in heaven. He came down as a bread of life. He lived a sinless life upon this earth. He was crucified outside Jerusalem's city wall for our sins. And then he was raised from the dead and he's now in heaven. They're waiting for God's son. They're waiting for God's son from heaven. He is coming. You know, there's, there's much going on in the world but Christ will come. He will bring peace to the Middle East. Nobody else will do it. Some will try. Some will pretend to be what they're not. But Christ will bring peace to the Middle East. He'll bring peace to Iran. and He'll bring peace throughout all the world. He will take the government upon his shoulder. He's morally able to do it. He's fit to do it. He has clean hands. He has not lifted up his heart in pride. He will establish rule and government for God and will deliver the kingdom unto God. He is fit to reign. He's coming to take believers and remove us from sin within and glorify us. We're waiting for a son from heaven. Are you waiting for a son from heaven? Because, well, if you're not saved... I, I would judge that you would be terrified of his son coming from heaven, coming in wrath, coming in judgment, coming to, to remove all things that, 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 that defile. The Thessalonians believers, they were waiting for his son. They were waiting for him from heaven. They were waiting for the one that was raised from the dead. They were Waiting for one who says, even Jesus, the lowly, pure, humble Savior, who's willing to save your soul. There's none like him. He's Lord. He's Christ. He's the eternal one. He's God's son. And it says the fifth thing, which delivered us from the wrath to come. He is the deliverer from wrath. We all deserve the wrath of God eternally. The wrath of God is about to be manifested upon this earth. Christ is coming. We're waiting for his coming. I wait not for, his, I wait not for the, the outpouring of wrath upon this earth. I'm waiting for Christ to come from heaven and to take me home and to avoid the wrath that's coming on this earth. And not only the wrath that is about to be unfolded on, on this godless earth, but the eternal wrath that will abide on every soul who rejects Christ. That's the, that's the danger you're in. I said already, it's a day of opportunity. It's a day of grace. You could taste the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ this, this very afternoon. You could bend the knee to him. You could turn to God through Christ. Turn to God to serve the living and the true God. Turn and believe in Christ and have your sins forgiven. That's the, the reality that could be your experience. I wonder, will there be any that would be like the Thessalonians, 
like those who believed. And they hear the message of Jesus Christ. And they bow to him and say, Lord, I believe. Lord, thou hast died for me. I trust thee as my saviour. I trust you right now. With all my guilt and sin, I come to thee and trust thee for everlasting life. As Paul said, just up the coast from here, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Let us pray. Father, we thank thee for thy son. We thank thee for his sacrifice. We thank thee thou didst raise him from the dead and we thank thee he's alive forevermore. We pray the bless one and all who have heard thy word and we pray and commit it unto thyself in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing a... Uh...